This is our fucking city. He just shook up the world. <laughs> I don't even know where you're sitting at. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's your boy, Rollin Fonte, here with Taking This Sports. Don't forget, we're not really the guys that watch these sports, but we analyze them. So today, we're obviously going to cover the tragic accident and loss of Kobe Bryant and the other passengers that, that were also in that helicopter crash. And then we're going to cover the, the more original uh, sports that we cover on the show, which would be MMA and boxing, uh, covering the, the last UFC event, uh, Fight Night 166, and then also the Danny Garcia fight that happened over the weekend. So before we actually start covering the sports, out of Respect, respect for Kobe Bryant and what he did for the NBA for so many years. I'm going to give an eight-second uh, uh, time of respect of silence. So here we go. All right, rest in peace, Kobe Bryant. Listen, Kobe Bryant, lis listening to those news, even as one of the biggest Celtics fans th that you'll ever know, it was, it was ridiculous. I was in shock. I was quiet. Uh, my wife asked me what happened. I sounded like a family member, like somebody that I knew personally passed away. And that wasn't the case. It's just when you talk about the, the, the true greatness uh, that comes out of athletes, there's only certain athletes that I could think of that brought that out in, in, in several sports. Uh, that, that's Kobe Bryant. That, obviously, Michael Jordan. You have Tom Brady, and you got a guy like Derek Jeter. There's so many great players that are out there, right? But these guys are on a different level. It's like saying Tom Brady retires today and dies four or five years from now. Kobe Bryant was 41 years old. I remember seeing the 60-point game when I was like, I don't know, man. Is Kobe Bryant going to be able to perform tonight because he looked like crap the first couple minutes? Then he goes and, 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 and is unstoppable. He looked amazing, ends up with 60. The team comes back and wins that game. And, of course, I tuned into that game over the Golden State Warriors game that they went and broke the Chicago Bulls uh, 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 record for most wins in the season. That's how popular this guy was. I didn't grow up watching Michael Jordan. I didn't. I know how great he was because I'm fortunate enough to grow up in an era where we have YouTube and we're able to watch the highlights of Michael Jordan. But honestly, as a 27-year-old man, I don't remember watching Michael Jordan that, that often. I remember seeing him in the Wizards. But 1996, I was four years old. The man that I remember watching growing up was that bad man in Kobe Bryant. The old 7 8 year when he wins the MVP and the Boston Celtics get their big three and beat LeBron James in the first round of the playoffs going in game seven and the Celtics can't win on the road and the Lakers can't win on the road so what happens it's a game seven at home for the Celtics and the Celtics pull off the NBA finals where Paul Pierce becomes the 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 NBA finals MVP that man Kobe Bryant carried that team yes he had Lamar Odom Paul Gasol we, we got to remember that their 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 center wasn't wasn't there uh, uh what's what's the center's name uh the center no no Paul Gasol wasn't on that team yet Listen, we'll, we'll, we'll get back to that, but... but oh, Andrew hey, Yes, Andrew Bynum. Thank you. Thank you, producer. Listen, Andrew Bynum hadn't played that, that, that year, but it was just amazing how Kobe Bryant just carried that team and just refused to lose every single time a team was, was ahead of him. He was the type of man, look at that, grew up in Italy, comes to the United States understands the culture and I only I, I only think that he speaks English and Italian right there's an interview that you see that Kobe Bryant states that he doesn't know how to speak Spanish he only speaks the two languages and then Kobe Bryant does that interview in Spanish that makes people like 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 Hispanics so proud because that just shows that 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 he wanted to be more than just a basketball player he wanted to be great at everything he did so I want to thank him for everything that he did uh, uh, in his basketball career and it looked like he was going to do amazing amazing things for the NBA and for other other sports around the world and just how he impacted people um, but obviously it was cut too short so I just want to say thank you Kobe Bryant you'll be missed um, and, and, and it truly, truly impacted so many people growing up, uh, uh, including myself. So with that being said, I'm going to take a short break and, and then continue on with MMA and boxing. Thanks, guys. Hey, guys, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and don't forget to hit that bell button for more notifications. So with that being said, we're going to continue on with Danny Garcia's last fight. Listen, Danny Garcia was one of my favorite welterweights in boxing. He came up, upset Amir Khan, ended up knocking his 
head off. Amir Khan never came back the same. He was he was one of these prospects that were up and coming. I didn't think he stood a chance against Amir Khan. I thought Amir Khan was too fast for him. Next thing you know, that left hook. That left hook from hell that he throws ends up connecting and it changes everything. He becomes a champion. Defends his title against Lucas Matisse when everybody was dodging. Lucas Matisse ends up breaking his or orbital bone. And, and Lucas Matisse never comes back the same either. Uh, you know, he was one of these guys that I was really excited to see compete in a welterweight division that was owned by Manny Pacquiao and Floyd Mayweather. These guys were getting old. It was time for the new guys to come out and make the, their own statement on why they were the greatest welterweight in the world. But then you have Danny Garcia, years and years later, that it just seems like he fights uh, 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 with the, the top guys and just loses, or he cherry picks against old fighters that are still ranked in the welterweight division, or he picks, as we've seen before, uh, against, what was it, Smelka, an unranked opponent in the welterweight division and just demolishes them, which is what you should do as a top welterweight. I'm not impressed by, by Danny Garcia anymore. Honestly, I would prefer to have, have seen him lose last week because if, if you're going to cherry pick the fighters, that's a trauma that I already dealt with with Floyd Mayweather. Let the guys that are the best fight the best. We already know that there's so many issues with the promoters uh, uh, not putting their best guy up front. And when we have fighters that are not willing to fight the best of the best, I don't want to see them fight at all. So listen, Danny Garcia ends up saying that his opponent was supposed to be Earl Spence Jr. But obviously we know that Earl Spence Jr. got that DUI, had that accident that if he had a seatbelt on, uh, you know, he actually... Uh, 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 ironically would have died seatbelt off gets flown out of the car car goes into pieces and guess what he ends up surviving and can fight another day so danny garcia goes into this fight against uh ivan red cash i forget I, I like to say red back but i know that's not right listen he goes into this fight and he he does what he's supposed to do he's countering he's moving his defense is great that's danny garcia um he's not getting out work like he does in all these fights where he actually loses close decisions uh but ivan uh red red calf Cash actually wasn't throwing a lot of shots until later in the fight. The most entertaining thing that happened in this fight was that Ivan actually bit Danny Garcia like Mike Tyson did all those years ago against Holyfield. He bit him on the shoulder and, and actually said, oh, Mike Tyson, and backed up. At the end of the round, Danny Garcia and his father complained about the bite mark. Nothing happened. If I was Danny Garcia, I would not have shaken it, this man's hands after the fight. I would have been pissed. I would have done everything in my power to knock this guy out. But Danny Garcia, you can see, I don't know if he was slowing down or was just taking the, the, the later rounds easier, but you could see that his, his offensive output just wasn't there once he found out that he wasn't going to be able to finish his opponent. So next for Danny Garcia, I think he should step up and fight Sean Porter. I know he doesn't like these guys that are that are in his face, you know, constantly applying pressure, and that's Sean Porter, man. He gets dirty. He gets in there. I'll see him fight any day of the week. He might lose the big fights too, but he's an entertaining fighter. He comes out and puts his heart out every single time he goes to perform. And he actually goes to win. And, he, and, and, and even, like I said, even though he loses these, these closer fights, I watch him any single day of the week because of, because of the heart that he shows. So I think Sean Porter against Danny Garcia, none of them have opponents. It wouldn't make sense to have Earl Spence Jr. come back and instantly fight Danny Garcia. I think Earl Spence Jr., after that car accident, we need to see where he's going to be at. Can he ever be the same guy? Hopefully, obviously, it'll be great for the sport because we obviously want to see him fight Terrence Crawford down the line, see who the true pound-for-pound -pound number one fighter is in the world. But that being said, Earl Spence Jr., please come back and fight. Uh, have a tune-up fight and have Danny Garcia fight Sean Porter. Then, if he could prove that he could be actually one of these top five welterweights, then Danny Garcia could fight Earl Spence Jr. Because we all know that Terrence Crawford and Earl Spence Jr., it doesn't happen like that in boxing. It's not like UFC where you get the best of the best guys. Promoters are going to go back and forth. Bob Barum and, 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 uh, and whoever uh, Earl Spence Jr.'s uh, promoter is, right? Uh, Al Heyman, right? Those guys don't see eye to eye. It's going to happen in a few years, unfortunately, guys. So that's what I got so far. Danny Garcia, yo, you got to step your game up. So with that being said, I'm actually going to give a quick recognition to Chris Cyborg that just won her, her fourth major title in, in, a, in a different conference, being Strikeforce, Invicta, the UFC, and Al Bellator. She showed up and actually bounced back really good. We all know what happened against Amanda Nunez. She just came, came forward gun bla guns blazing, got caught with a hook, and that was the end. Uh, and and uh, in my opinion, I wish that that they would uh, do do joint uh, MMA bouts. Right, you have Amanda Nunez from uh, representing the UFC, 
and you have Chris Cyborg uh, representing Bellator. Those those two franchises are always going back and forth. Get those two women in, in the octagon again. Make it happen. Put all the beef aside, Dana White. That would be a great match to happen. So again, congratulations, Chris Cyborg. So now to talk about the main event of the evening on UFC Fight Night 166. It was headlining Curtis Blades against Junior Dos Santos, where Junior Dos Santos came in, ranked the number fourth light heavyweight in the world, and Curtis Blades came in the number third light heavyweight in the world. Listen, these fighters are, 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 are two of my favorite fighters in that division. Reason being is because of the ground game that Curtis Blaze brings. He's a new face in the division uh, uh, that I think uh, could, could change things. Actually, I'm sorry, not the light heavyweight division, the heavyweight division where the baddest men in the planet, planet are. You had Junior DeSantos, a, a former champion, that's trying to work his way up. And, and you have Curtis Blaze that's trying to get a title shot, but he has Francis Ngannou that has beaten him twice in, in the division. Um, in this fight, listen, I, I like the way that Junior Dos Santos was able to move around. I thought his footwork was extremely in, in, impressive. Curtis Blades, obviously, having the wrestler's background, he's going to try to take, take him down because we all know how good Curtis Blades is on the ground. But JDS was not allowing him to take him down. He was actually defending real well, and, and, and Junior Dos Santos actually caught him with a good one, too, in the beginning of the, of the, of the fight that caused Blades to want to shoot right away. But again... Uh, JDS used his footwork and, and actually was able to get out of that. I was like, oh man, this could be really, really good because I was rooting for JDS. He's a really good guy. Not nothing from Blaze, but man, JDS is my guy. Um, second round starts and it's the same thing, but here's the problem. Now JDS is, is, is expecting the takedown so, so much that he's actually dropping his hands from already having them really low to having them even lower so he'll be able to stuff and, and, and also defend at the same time with his hands. So the problem with that of having your hands low is what? A wrestler is going to look at that and he might fake that he's going to shoot and come up bang. And that's what was happening. Curtis Blaze was starting to catch JDS very, very clean and JDS was making a mistake, right? Anytime that 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 Curtis Blades was was faking the, the, the shot, JDS was throwing uppercuts from way too far. And I've said it before in my videos, the worst punch to throw is an uppercut from too far because look how open you are. Even if you have your left hand up as, as an orthodox fighter, there's way too much body exposed. And, and, and so I knew the end was near for JDS. What happens? Curtis Blades catches him with a clean one-two. The two, which, which is being the straight right, actually lands right on the jaw of JDS. I thought, I was shocked, honestly, that JDS didn't go down with that shot. He gets wobbled. Then you have the more tight clinch by Curtis Blades. He does a great job going to the body, working the head, and that's all she wrote. JDS ends up losing this fight. Curtis Blades deserves, uh, uh, if not a title fight, that he's not going to get that. It's going to be Steve Miocic against DC. I'm sorry. I would love to see him run it back against Francis Ngannou, unfortunately. There's not that many options in the heavyweight division. But if he's smart, he'll avoid that, right? Because he's already lost to him twice. And if he loses to him a third time, that is just terrible, man. I, I would wait it out, see what happens against uh, Stipe and, and DC. What's the worst that happens? DC wins the title. He vacates because he retires. And then you could fight Stipe uh, for the title. Or Stipe wins the title. And then... Uh, 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 you could fight for the title anyways, you know, being Curtis Blaze. So I think that there's positivity there, uh, uh, just being patient, sitting back. He's done what he has to do, and, and, and the title fight will come soon. Next fight that I want to cover, it was the cold main event of the evening, being RDA, uh, Rafael Dos Anjos against uh, Michael Chiesa. Chiesa looked amazing at 170. Obviously, him cutting 155 was insane being that tall, having the 6'2 frame, right? It's bizarre because you would think a guy that big would, would try to work on his kickboxing or, or, or his stand-up game, but he prefers the jiu-jitsu. He prefers being, being on the ground and dirty. So, and, and especially with a guy like RDA, you would have thought that uh, Michael Chiesa would try to change his game plan from other fights before. So the first round starts, starts right away, and you have RDA that, that starts landing some nasty body kicks because Michael Chiesa is so worried about, about the straight right from the Southpaw fighter being RDA. Um, and then also, uh, he's circling. Um, so RDA sees that he's circling, circling around, starts going to the body. Eventually, uh, RDA ends up landing an overhand left that Chiesa was worried about. It must have flipped the switch on Chiesa right away because Chiesa ends up go, uh, shooting and getting a takedown. And, and for the most part, that's how that's how the round went. Um, I, I don't think the round actually ended up getting on the feet again. So uh, it was a close round, but I got to give it to Chiesa because of, of top control in that first round. 
Second round, it was more of the same. You have Michael Chiesa that, again, he, he's, he's throwing the one-two, but it's very lazy. And I was like, man, what's going on here? Is RDA going to be able to throw shots uh, above? Maybe. But the problem is, is uh, Michael Chiesa's size. RDA is small even for, for, for that division at 170. I thought he was small at lightweight. So imagine as a welterweight, he just, he just fits in with the welterweights because of, of, of his, his background. You know what I mean? He's so experienced that he's able to fit in. But you see the, the struggles that he gets against bigger fighters. So again, Michael Chiesa actually gets a takedown and, and starts to work a, a Kimura. Um, but again, the experience of RDA being a, a, a black belt jiu-jitsu guy um, is able to stay calm, work the hips, turn it over. Michael Chiesa get, gets top control. What, what does RDA do? He, he, uh, he moves the hips, flips Michael Chiesa, and gets it back, uh, back standing. But listen, it was the same thing over and over again. Uh, Michael Chiesa gets another takedown with 59 seconds remaining, and then that ends up being the second round. So remember, RDA was in five straight five-round fights. This is his first uh, uh, three-round fight in, in his last six fights. So he's got to know, man, that he needs a knockout or a submission or something because the first and second rounds were too close. I liked, I liked the idea of RDA maybe winning the second round because he landed more strikes in the stand-up game. But again, top control was all Michael Chiesa the entire fight. And guess what? Surprise, surprise, the third round, it was more of the same. Top control by Michael Chiesa gets a takedown. RDA is not able to get back up, and it ends up being a unanimous decision for Michael Chiesa. So the fight is over, and Michael Chiesa actually gets a unanimous decision against RDA that is ranked the number five welterweight in the world. That puts him up there in the top 10, absolutely. What surprised me is that Michael Chiesa actually called out Colby Covington. I'm going to repeat that. Chaos Kobe Covington. That's who he called out in this fight. I don't think Michael Chiesa deserves to get this fight, though. Uh, uh, slow your roll. There's plenty of guys that, that, that should be fighting Kobe Covington. I think, in my opinion, if you were to fight Kobe Covington, you're biting off more than you could chew, my, my brother, because Kobe Covington, yes, he lost to Kamaru Usman, but he's a different kind of animal. Just ask Rob, excuse me, Robbie Lawler. Listen, if Michael Chiesa really wants to, to, to fight somebody, uh, I, I honestly, I think he should pick somebody like Robbie Lawler or, hey, a Damian Maia. That's another grappling guy that is on the safe side and it'll keep him uh, relevant and in the top 10. But fighting those top guys like Tyron Woolley, Kobe Covington, Kamaru Usman, uh, Jorge Masvidal, you see where I'm getting at? You have to be all-round fighters. And Michael Chiesa... He's very, very one-dimensional. Let me take you down. Let, let me keep you there. Ground and pound here and there. Eh, let me try to submit you. That's all he has. These guys could fight standing. These fight. These guys could fight on the ground. They're so well-rounded. I would never wish that on Michael Chiesa. Just look at what happened with Kevin Lee. Kevin Lee is not at the elite level that those guys are that I just mentioned. And Kevin Lee ended up submitting rear naked choke Michael Chiesa. So stay in your lane, brother, but congratulations on the win. So with that, guys, that actually wraps up our take for the night. I hope you guys enjoyed it as I did. Don't forget, guys, we're not only the guys that watch these sports, but we analyze them here with your boy, Raul Infante, on Taking This Sports.